welcome to an episode of the Jet Rails podcast. Uh, this week, we're going to be talking to you about e-commerce post-purchase interactions. So what happens to your customer after the honeymoon uh, or after the marriage? They've, they've made a purchase. Uh, they've sealed the deal. Now they still have expectations. They still have uh, wants and needs that need to be met and how e-commerce uh, merchants can really uh, either rise to the occasion or perhaps not. <laughs> I'm joined by uh, James, who's representing the team at uh, Relay Cloud. Um, and uh, James, welcome back to the podcast and uh, congrats on, on your new role with Relay Cloud. I'm glad to always uh, ha have folks back on. And um, would you do the, the honor of introducing yourself? Sure. Thanks for having me. Happy Friday. I'm happy to be back on, you know, I love being, um, you know, a panelist and, you know, chatting about what is relevant in the space and, you know, what's important to me is just figuring out what the trends are and um, what's kind of essential in, you know, uh, what merchants need and how they connect to their customers. So, you know, happy to talk a little bit about what's been going on, um, you know, over here at Relay and, you know, more at a macro level too, about what's happening at the ecosystem level. So, Happy to be here and happy to contribute. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Yeah. And well, you know, I, I know right now you're out at the Jersey Shore. So wrapping up with, with uh, you know, the, the very tail end of the summer, um, a little jealous. It's been a while since, since I've uh, I've been up in the Northeast. But, um, you know, let's take it from the top with Relay Cloud. So how did uh, did the team come to the name? Um, it's a little bit unique, gets the brain moving a little bit. Yeah, definitely. You know, Relay Cloud. Um, so, in its nature, it was a platform built by merchants for merchants in a way. Um, and what we learned is that, you know, es essentially it's relaying information from one system to another. And we do that in, by the means of an ETL. So, it's extract, transfer, load. Um, so, it's you know, like an ipass esque type of solution. And I'm sure you have experience working there for some of your past roles. Um, so that's how we came up with the name. And, you know, within Relay, you know, there's a couple components. Um, there's route, returns, um, but essentially, you know, Relay transmits info from one system to another to help um, really automate the process and have a common backend. Cool. And, you know, Going back to my uh, my my opener, <laughs> what is it that typically happens after purchase? The users, uh, the shoppers at this at that point, the customers really, uh, you know, they place an order on the site. They see some kind of message letting them know that the order has successfully been completed. It's gone through. What's next in in the journey? Uh, and uh, you know, good, bad, or otherwise what uh, what should be happening yeah so you know i guess kudos to all the performance marketing and dev agencies that got them to that point right um so they got wooed from that uh, that angle but i think that you know there's a, there's a bit of a green space where once you hit the purchase button there there's definitely opportunity to improve that that journey so really in essence um you know having a lot of uh you know, connection to that customer from that point of purchase until it hits their doorstep or, you know, in the event of return, how you can, you know, save some money there. So the, I don't think the honeymoon's totally over yet, you know, with that being said. So, well, when I look at customers, you know, I try to figure out what they need and those customers to us are merchants and what um, what's important is trying to find a way of personalizing and tailoring uh, experience uh, as well as streamlining it. It's kind of like a harmony of both. Um, so like personally, like when I order something, I'm always keen on shipment notifications and how would that drive me nuts? Like kind of navigating through various links, the foreign shipping landing pages. And I think they're kind of ambiguous at best. Like I remember a couple times like tracking numbers were, um, not matched up properly. They said it was delivered when it never even was shipped, stuff like that. It's, um, it's interesting that, you know, the, the gold standard for years has been that basic transactional email. Mm -hmm. You get a, an, an email that says your order is received, your order is in process, your order is complete. 
uh, your order, you know, I guess, you know, somewhere in there is uh, shipped uh, and you hope that it has a tracking number. You don't know if the tracking number is always going to work, especially if it just hit the system and it hasn't even shipped out the door yet. And so you think you're going to get an idea on when you're going to receive this item, but you really don't have a lot of clarity. Uh, so is that uh, a, a big piece of the puzzle? It's getting these pretty bland emails, uh, you know, that, that don't really give you all the insight that you're looking for? Yeah, you know, in the context of transactional emails and, you know, how does that connect or make customers happy or sad? It's like, you know, I don't think the customer journey stops once you hit the purchase button like we spoke about. And I think it kind of comes to how you're going to connect um, those dots. And transactional in nature has always kind of been the backbone of that. Um, you know, here at Relay, we use Amazon SCS, which is a nice deliverable. Um, but I think in nature, um, that market's starting to evolve. So we're not only transactional, we're looking at S SMS and other solutions as well. Um, but in terms of like specific milestones and extracting specific um, phase gates, like so when an order is processed or picked up or in transit or delivered, um, stuff like that, I, I think Relay empowers the merchant to choose what milestone they would like to share within that customer um, experience, opposed to periodically checking a foreign UPS landing page. Um, like statistically speaking, I believe three times um, a merchant checks a specific tracking order. Um, so I think to try to prevent them proactively reaching out, I think it's still a part of that journey or responsibility at the merchant level to connect that that harmony um, to give them those those real time updates. Yeah, is it the big mass retailers like Amazon that have really set the gold standard? Is it uh, you know that all the the SMB and mid market and even in some cases enterprise merchants are stuck uh, chasing after? The big guys, what's going on on that side of the market? Because I know that there's always a lot of attention on the front of the house on how to, you know, really make the shopping experience you know, really effective um, and get people through the checkout. But, you know, is our merchants upgrading the experience post purchase because they want to or more or less because as they're behind the curve, um, they're they're feeling the pain that you know customers now recognize what you know good versus bad because there are new standards being set uh, up market. Mm. Yeah, I, I call that like the Amazon effect, right? And how people um, and businesses respond to it. So, you know, I think the retail environment online is always in a state of fluctuation, and because of that state. I think the Amazon effect is essentially in nature matching speed and efficiency. And I, I read a study uh, back in 2018 where it showed customers expected 43% of consumers um, that were surveyed expected a much faster delivery that same year. And you can only imagine what it is this year. <laughs> um, so within that, to, com to meet that expectation, uh, more e-commerce companies turn to like a courier software to match or exceed Amazon's delivery performance, uh, specifically the need for oh, sorry, automation, personalization, route visualization, real-time tracking notifications, um, it, you know, features like that. That makes sense. And are there a few like major friction points that happen somewhere between the merchant and the customer? Um, that are frequent reasons that uh, a customer wouldn't want to come back to that merchant or that the merchant feels like, um, you know, they're losing out somewhere that, that there's something that really needs to be optimized. Hmm. Um, I think points of friction are established through lack of communication. So I'd say to, con to combat that is how can we effectively, you know, navigate that, that messaging and, you know, I read an article where e-commerce merchants was confident uh, that they knew what their repeat purchasers, which is essentially their VIPs, what they wanted. And um, 
there was a survey done off of that same customer base, and they said that only 47% of his repeat customers actually felt like they that merchant knew what the what they really wanted and had that harmony of that um, understanding. So there's there's definitely room for improvement, and I think um, we may need more psychologists in the industry. That's what you're telling me. We're we're going to yeah. need to have some kind of group therapy session between the the customers and and the merchants. Um, because they're not speaking the same language, you know, the, the merchants are from Mars and the customers are from Venus or vice versa, something like that. Mm, yep, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that is not how the world works. Um, so just how much of an impact could a, a more positive post-purchase uh, interaction or experience really have on retention and lifetime value? on the metrics that merchants really care about? Mm. So, you know, I think of post-purchase, I always kind of think of like my email days working at Dot Digital, um, because that definitely has a part of it of how that revenue is tied to their bottom line. Um, So like some quick stats, right? Um, Based off of a survey that I read, 69% of consumers are much less or less likely to shop with a retailer in the future if an item they purchased is not delivered within two days of the date promised. So there's a lot of weight in terms of the integrity there. Um, Another one is 17% of respondents will stop shopping with a retailer after receiving a late delivery once. Um, And then finally, 55% of respondents will stop shopping with the retailer after receiving a late delivery two to three times. And I think, you know, having a positive post-purchase interaction will counteract all that, right? So you kind of got to go from the negative to positive to be like, well, what's the data telling me and how can I avoid that in the future? Um, One way that we've uh, counteracted some of those pretty significant numbers is, you know, if there was a return that was uh, requested, we could have SKU-based rules built so you can automate the process, connect to your OMS, connect to your email, connect to your e-commerce platform, um, which helps the merchant, but how does that help the customer? So one thing we did is once you, you know, print out the packing slip, you get the RMA going, you get the, the return processed, and uh, really as a feature where you can just uh, generate store credit in the form of like an e-gift card. So you can shop for what you want right away, and you don't necessarily have to wait until the stuff's received, inspected, and stuff like that. And again, those are all SKU-based rules that is ultimately configured and controlled at the merchant level. But that gives flexibility and freedom in terms of how um, the customers can engage and to avoid some of uh, you know um, those two degrees of separation. On you know, yeah. uh, I mean, they're products that. As a merchant, you're not going to have the user ship back. It's not cost effective. It's not worth it. Um, you really do just want them to go take something else and, and move on. And in some cases, you're going to collect the insurance dollars uh, from the shipper on, on that order or whatever else anyway. Um, so you might be covered. But isn't it interesting, though, going back to some of those stats that you know most orders are shipped with the, the, the same uh, couriers, the same delivery companies, UPS, FedEx, USPS, perhaps DHL, or, uh, you know, just thinking in North America, there's a limited number that, that are really, uh, you know, operating on a large scale. Um, and so the delays that, that the customer will have, um, you know, some of that could certainly be on, uh, on the item leaving the warehouse. Maybe, you know, there wasn't a correct tally of inventory and they sold something that they couldn't ship on the spot or, um, their systems went down or something and they didn't ship on time. But most of the time, I would imagine the delays are coming into the system because of things happening, you know, by the, del- th- you would be using the same, let's say FedEx system, whether you ordered from merchant A or merchant B, is it really the merchant's fault if FedEx didn't get it there on time? Uh, if, you know, something didn't make it out onto the truck that day, or there was a wildfire or hurricane or, COVID shutdown or something else going on. It's an interesting year. <laughs> Lots going on. But, uh, yeah, but but the customers really have that high, high expectation around the delivery date, even though it's one of the things that the merchant has the least control over. 
Yeah. So I guess at that point, it really does come down to the the customer service and interactions and um, and communications. So uh, you know, it's all about managing expectations in life. So you know, I, I know from the other side of the the coin um, that you can also wind up spending a lot of money on customer service, uh, whether it's you know dealing with emails or dealing with phone calls or whatever mode you go through whatever communications uh you have open to users having them reaching out to you about tracking and uh and armies and other things is is a bit messy um do do you find that that's a major selling point for improving this part of the stack that it can actually not only bring up let's say you know long term lifetime value for the customer and uh and retention, but that it, it can have an impact on uh, on their bottom line in terms of their overhead when it comes to customer service. Hmm. Yeah, you know it's interesting. I mean, Relay essentially was built um, by merchants for merchants, so you know this is already a problem that we were facing with uh, customer service expenses and how that increases payroll. But I think the the underlying message when it comes to customer service is it really comes into you know the customer acquisition costs of a new versus existing. So it's you know five times the cost of acquiring a new customer dealing with as opposed to dealing with one unhappy existing customer. So if you can t- turn that frown upside down, it's definitely worth the investment. Um, you know specifically with one of our retailers, um, you know they they ended up hiring three warehouse employees to manage returns, and the process was kind of painful. Um, But I think while that was essentially justified at a payroll perspective, um, I think that there was a lot of manual processes that they faced where they were getting shipments um, back from returns and they had to open it up, see where it was and trying to update individual systems. Um, And what Relay was able to provide was streamlining that process. And you scan the barcode and, you know, it goes into Relay, it goes into the OMS and goes to the e-com platform, you know, in one shot. Um, so a click or two, then, you know, you're good as opposed to individually siloed, you know, updates there. So while I think it's a necessary evil to have that customer sense on your, on your P&L sheet for an expenses, I, I mean, from a, from a CAC perspective, it makes a lot of sense to, to, to maintain that. Um, and then, you'd, um, you'd much rather have your staff working on things that are going to drive in new customers and new revenue. And it's not always about, you know, cutting, uh, payroll. It's sometimes just about having people do things that are, are efficient. It's the same reason that we, you know, automate so much. It's, it's efficiency. It's, uh, you know, why would you have manual data entry and errors along the way if, if you could, uh, automate the data flows, mm-hmm. so, you know? So it makes sense. I'm going to uh, jump back to something else. We had a, an episode very recently on SEO where um, I asked about fringe benefits because, you know, a lot of the times people don't realize that, hey, you know, you you improve your SEO rankings, but as part of the SEO process, you wound up with all of this other really great content out there that, you know, helps with brand awareness and um, you, you know, added... Uh, uh, alt tags to images, and that's good for people, you know, w- with uh, disabilities that are visiting the site and that can't see the images the way that, that we can. Um, I would imagine that in this case, fixing some of that, you know, delivery system, because, hey, you know, I, I get an email that says something's being, uh, something's shipped. I might click that link once, but I don't check it every day or two. And then when there is a delay, I rarely know about it. Um, so it's not until I wonder where is that thing that I start to figure out what's going on. I would imagine that this probably brings down chargebacks, which is a whole other uh, landscape that we've we've also talked about recently on the podcast. Um, but that <coughs> negative reviews, uh, if I know what's going on proactively, I'm a lot less likely to, you know, and I'm pretty chill with this stuff in the first place. But uh, I would think for the average consumer that that you're just going to be a lot more relaxed about the process if you you're kept in the loop and you know what's going on and you feel like it's all you know it's all being done as well as it could be versus the standard I don't know what's going on and now I've just figured out I thought I'd have it and I don't and I'm frustrated uh, would you say that that also 
plays in, um, you know, in, into the value prop of this stuff. So it's it's not just about you know showing people something pretty about when their order is going to arrive, but that there there are all of these things that are impacted by it. Yeah, you know, I think chargebacks and negative reviews is uh, something that every company deals with on certain levels, and um, you know, returns definitely play into that. So if you have the ability to have that speed and efficiency, like that Amazon esque effect, I think you'd be able to to mitigate it. But you do run into scenarios where someone purely doesn't want what they were provided. So you could, in in essence, um, instead of losing that revenue leveraging one of our tools on, you know, providing store credit. Mm. And I think that is huge. Um, and then if it's a negative review, it depends on your review provider. Some of them let you edit and delete the reviews at the business level, which is kind of frowned upon. Um, but a lot of times it kind of comes down to the shipping carrier's fault when it's not the merchant itself. So I always try to, you know, navigate that by just being like, well, Offer them like a unique coupon code or something. Um, offer them, you know, a discount on a future purchase. Offer them a return and giving them store credit to get something else. Um, trying to find ways to improve the experience by offering to reach out, you know, to have a conversation. Those kind of things are important. Um, and I think those are ways that you can mitigate it and retain that revenue from um, that store credit. And the other piece of it is just, you know, the, the workflow on the back end for the merchant is just having uh, product based rules that you can just automatically, you know, figure out what you need and then just send it back and then off you go. It's really just trying to automate and streamline in a personalized way. Um, so I, I would say, yeah, you know, I mean, look, you know I, yeah. if I order a TV and it comes broken, they're going to want it back. If I order I don't know, you know, a $5 item, probably not going to want it back. So, uh, you know, I I think that that kind of automation makes a lot of sense because otherwise you have somebody fill out, uh, you know, go through some kind of customer service to figure out filling out an RMA, uh, a a return uh, management authorization. And just for them to find out, you know, like too many steps, (laughs) what they need to do next. It's nice when, um, that can all be pre-established and customer facing in essence. It doesn't need to wait, you know, day often, you know, you go through an RMA process and you wait a day or two for a response um, from the brand, uh, from the merchant and just that time loss back and forth. As a customer, I like to deal with something, be done with it and move on to the next thing. I don't like getting trapped in uh, back and forth cycles with, with that stuff. So. Mm. Uh, it, it certainly makes sense to me, and I'm gonna, you know, hit the uh, the rewind button again because at the uh, at the beginning of the episode you used the uh, the uh, the acronym uh, IPASS Integration Platform as a Service, which I'm <laughs> certainly very familiar with, of course, uh, based on my my personal background. Um, do you feel like or or you know, do you have uh, information that suggests that a lot of the issues in this world stem from uh, from a lack of integration between systems? So you've got your e-commerce platform, you've got your your ERP, your order management system, you've got different shipping systems, perhaps uh, you know, shipping software that you're using and and vendors. Is it a lack of integration that causes a lot of the friction points because one system doesn't really have enough data from the other? Yeah, you know, I mean, automation's key. And I think merchants are kind of, you know, looking for those types of connections out of the box. Um, so I think that has um, that has its own challenges, right? Because people don't want to build one-off integrations. They want cartridges. They want stuff that's already pre-built. They want stuff tied to a common backend. They want simplicity, it's kind of like why Zapier came into the play, right? Like, you know, they, they had a really good value at, you know, across the ecosystem. And then when it comes to specific post-purchase journey, we try to specialize that for the OMSs, the, e- the emails, the e-com uh, platforms and the SMS platforms that really play into what that journey entails. Um, and, you know, we were basically taking that problem and turning it into a solution. So, yeah, absolutely important. And 
uh, you know, given that if your system's a bit of a crossroads, what what's the data look like? Because I think that's often uh, an, another part of the problem is that if you have all these disjointed systems, then you don't really get enough insight into what's going on. It becomes very hard to analyze what the post-purchase uh, you know, experience is. It's a lot easier to look at the pre-purchase because you most people have at least Google Analytics. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, that's certainly the gold standard for a lot of merchants. Um, you know, it's it's where pretty much everybody starts and a lot of people finish. Um, but regardless of which analytics suite you're using, you can uh, get a tremendous amount of data about what's happening. And there's all sorts of platforms that sit on the front end to, you know, to split test, to multivariate testing uh, in order to see what makes an impact and, and what's... Uh, you know, what, what's going right, what's going wrong, and, and basically to optimize the experience, what happens on, on the back end here? Are there ways that users, uh, that merchants can really figure out what changes are having a positive impact on their business? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, you know, on our dashboard, we do have visits and clicks, so you do have some types of analytics on, in terms of your engagement. Um, in terms of where you want to spend your time, I would say making good use of your order tracking page. So kind of going back in time here a little bit where a customer tracks an order three times per order. Um, they're also on that same wavelength that opens another opportunity um, where they're three times more as likely to click through a marketing asset on that page versus a regular email. So it could be an upsell. It could be I'm not sure. It depends on your brand message if you're okay of putting third party, you know, advertisements on there. But in my personal opinion, I would probably just stick to your existing SKU base at at your product level and trying to work on an upsell as opposed to monetizing an order tracking page. But, you know, leveraging that platform. I think a, a lot of people miss out on the fact that a lot of their communications with their customers are transactional. And they don't take advantage of those opportunities to cross sell or, um, or, or, you know, share information. They're the blandest looking, plainest messages um, that really aren't very <laughs> enticing or interactive. Uh, and they serve a purpose, but I, I'm with you there that I, I think that there is a, a lot lost, um, you know, whether it's at a tracking page or in these other communications in terms of, uh, you know, the ability to move the needle, to actually share information that's actionable and that may lead to something good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, that's prime real estate, you know, so you could use that for your upsells. Um, And I think it's totally underutilized and it would really complement the recent purchase as well. Yeah. You know, in that sense, I know you've talked about um, rules and, you know, how customized do businesses need their post-purchase interactions to be? How streamlined can you can it really be across the board that this is sort of what merchants really need in general? And you know, how much does it come down to uh, you know individual business rules and operations? So you know, I mean, I I imagine that if you're selling food, that uh, you know you're going to have uh, different rules and operations versus if you're selling. I don't know, books or electronics or uh, that, you know, how you deal with shipping and refunds and returns and exchanges and all sorts of things may be very different. Yeah, you know, um, I would say kind of streamline the process, but like in a personalized way, like, you know, transactional emails doesn't sound fancy and it doesn't sound engaging or personalized. So like as a consumer myself, um, try to increase that post-purchase interaction is always an ambition of trying to make that connection stronger. Um, And I just can't tell you how many times I've seen like these cookie cutter emails and I've received where merchants, you know, they don't use that uh, way of connection Um, or even like historical purchase data on future suggestions. So, you know, my advice is simple. It's really just to ensure your message is relevant on brand and on time. That makes sense. I like when things <laughs> things that are complicated get simple. And would you say that you know? I mean, since platforms like Relay Cloud don't really 
uh, replace another software being used. It's almost the lack thereof. You know, it's just you're you typically using whatever's natively part of your e-commerce platform. Uh, is the sales cycle um, particularly long or short? I, I would imagine that because it's something that's not replacing something existing, it could go either way because either, well, it's not in the budget, it's not something we've planned for, or, um, you know, and because it's not replacing something or there's nothing in the way, so we could try this out right now. Do you find that, you know, that, that uh, a platform that's, uh, that's doing what, what Relay Cloud does um, is sort of a, a, a longer decision making process or a shorter one based upon um, just how underserved this part of the market is? Um, you know, you know, a couple things like, uh, you know, in terms of does it like replace something that merchants already have? Like, yeah, I think we tend to move relatively quick. Um, you know, once we understand like the requirements of what that merchant may be, we just really stand up, you know, uh, whatever their needs may be. Um, so it could be like their e-com platform they need to hook up with. We have a quick plug and play there for all the major players, you know, an OMS platform to uh, retrieve and obtain the order data, um, you know, leveraging the transactional emails or the opt-in emails with like, you know, partners like Clavio um, or SMS solutions and essentially trying to have them all talk together to automate the process is important. Um, and in terms of like, you know, where we're headed, it's really that roadmap is kind of based off of what the future needs of the merchant are. Um, but it makes clear sense to already have, you know, the e-com platforms, uh, the marketing automation channels, and then the ERPs and the OMSs of the world ready to go. So those, are, in some cases, are some big, you know, the ERPs, OMSs, some of these things are pretty heavy to integrate with in some cases even though in this case, it's a limited integration, you're not integrating with every field of data that they have. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you're, you're really dealing with, with some very specific APIs, um, I would imagine. But what is the implementation uh, process or timeline like? Is this something that takes, you know, a couple of business days? Or is this something that, that takes the better part of a year? Um, mm -hmm. What's kind of average look like um, for getting all these systems talking together with, with something in between that's really configured with the right business rules? Yeah, you know, um, implementation is based off of the requirements. So if they just need a simple e-commerce plugin, they don't need to hook up to Magento, that's ready to go. Um, if they need a specific OMS that we're already connected to, that's only, you know, I'd say probably just, you know, um, probably a couple days for implementation, do some simple quality tests, we, you know, white glove the service and make sure we have a project manager, customer success person on the, on the team there. Um, and then if it's something custom in nature, um, you know, it could take a couple weeks, you know, two to four weeks on, on the high side, but relatively uh, streamlined in nature. Like you said, it's, it's a subset of what the platform requires. Um, of in some cases, probably uh, takes longer to get the business rules organized to figure out exactly what the customer wants. Um, you know, I know that that can take a while for, for some clients to, you know, really map out their goals um, and to get all the access straightened out that, uh, you know, I know that projects like this, they always vary in length. So there's best case scenario and, um, you know, best laid plans of mice and men sometimes kick in. Um, but it, that sounds all pretty reasonable for uh, for what it is. Um, has the Relay Cloud team had any major wins so far? So it sounds like it was built. You, you've used the phrase "built," uh, you know, by merchants for merchants. Um, so I take it that you know the original use cases were for some particular merchants that really wanted this, as opposed to you know some I'll I'll you know say you know uh, engineers or inventors out there that decided they were going to build something and start stomping the pavement, trying to find someone that wanted it. Yeah, you know, it, it's interesting. Um, I think there's specific verticals that match even better than some other ones. Um, one of them was in like fashion, beauty and jewelry space where they're really trying to have this, um, you know, emotional connection to their customers, right? Like their purchases are emotional, um, especially on the jewelry side. Um, one customer that we brought on uh, quite some time ago was Capert NYC. Um, but we, we, we really like, like them as a staple because they've really tried to transform their, their post-purchase experience. And, you know, we're leveraging them for, 
you know, um, kind of being the, you know, a, a bit of a voice really to, to kind of represent, you know, the industry, um, the vertical and how their message transcends to, you know, potential other, you know, um, brands that may be interested. Um, and for them, it was, you know, it was a quick inter- integration. It was an e-com connection. It was an OMS uh, connection. And um, the, they've definitely seen efficiency when it comes to the return process. But more importantly, that, um, that connection that they, they had with their, um, their customer. I think that, that plays, um, that harmonizes the journey in, in that type of uh, vertical. Well, that's interesting. You know, there's a lot of reasons why you want someone to have these positive uh, interactions with your brand. I mean, whether it's because you want them to place another order next week or because you want them to be out there telling everybody else what a great experience they had. Uh, you know, if you're selling mattresses, probably not selling anything to them again next week. But, uh, you, you know, you, you can really get a good uh, good cheerleader, get some grassroots, uh, you know, feedback out of that. So, and what um you know i know we've kind of piecemealed some of the feature set uh around what relay cloud is offering to merchants you know so in the core platform um you know i understand it's integrating with all these other systems and it's handling certain communications what are like the core feature sets uh that your team is providing the core feature sets, I mean, you know, really is kind of broken down into, you know, a couple of different arenas. Um, you know, it really works. And uh, so you have the return, you have the retrieve, and then you have relay. So, you know, really how we organize things is um, we have an out-of-box integration. Um, we we basically pride ourselves on having consumers who say they'll buy again from brands that offer easy returns. So, you know, having that out-of-box integration um, for those e-com platforms, real-time status updates, um, you know, updates on tracking shipments, the route, the ETA, faster and easier returns um, within Relay and automating everything, um, customizing reporting tools. So having access to that real-time data and those insights so you can improve every aspect of your customer experience. Um, and then, you know, having other types of stuff like uh, set rules based on the, uh, the SKU, the price, and many other variables that you can automate specific um, actions. So if something was damaged upon delivery, you can just have a checkbox for that and then it would automate the, uh, the back end of the system. So they would know that, okay, this is coming back. We're accepting this return. You don't have to email us. You don't have to call us. We're ready to go. And then it would just print, um, you know, initiate the RMA, offer the packing slip, box it up, and then you can drop it off of our, you know, our shipping carriers that we provided like UPS, USPS, FedEx, and DHL. Um, and then, you know, it really kind of depends on um, what the customer needs, right? Like if they need, you know, new hookups to specific um, different software applications or they want to personalize the email templates and um, they want to leverage more triggers for the transactional based emails. I mean, really just trying to customize what that journey looks like. Um, But hopefully that just gives you, you know, a high level overview. And what's the roadmap like? Anything new coming down the pike uh, that, that you can talk about that <laughs> that, that won't uh, give away anything proprietary? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I, I think um, it's relatively transparent where, you, you know, you want to focus on, you know, the means of communication. So expanding on, uh, you know, some of the top email providers out there, SMS providers out there. I think that's definitely an area to expand. Um also taking a look at, you know, some of the top uh, OMS and ERP platforms on top of what we already have. Um, those are probably the, what's within the foresight. And then, you know, I think there's also areas on the personalization side and leveraging partners on that horizon to, you know, you can transform uh, the UX UI of the email based off of the gender, you know, and just, you know, styling in the templates. I think there's opportunity there um, instead of just putting your branding on top. So, 
you know, really getting kind of like hyper personalized in an automated way is kind of where I think see things kind of shifting. So that could be a little bit later down the line. And then, um, you know, uh, we already have Zendesk in there, but, you know, I think other, you know, you know, um, help desks like and, Slack yeah. and stuff like that. So, um, it just depends how the organization's built and based off of the customer feedback we have off our existing customer base that dictates our roadmap. That's interesting. You know, I've noticed technology partnerships coming up a few times, uh, in different ways. So companies like Clavio and Zendesk and how is partnership really, um, you know, driving the roadmap? Is that a lot of, um, you know, a, a lot of next steps for the company? It's helping uh, merchants to leverage these other channels and these other systems as part of the mix, um, getting the data moving back and forth. Yeah. You know, um, you know, building out requirements and knowing who you want to partner with. I mean, I feel like you already know before you even reach out to the people a lot of times, right? Like there's so much information in terms of trying to like validate uh, what a use case may look like, um, you know, from an internal stakeholder perspective or a merchant requirement. So a lot of those things kind of just organically uh, flush out on your day-to-day engagement. So, um, you know, with my background in email, I would, I would know that, you know, transactional email is super important. And if you want to style the email within a specific ESP, that's, that's a, a natural organic uh, progression. Um, but it also helps to, you know, have the relationship there to, so you have that buy-in, um, you know, to discuss the integration, flush out the integration, QA the integration, and then, you know, do some promotion behind it and, you know, a really build your decision making based off of what your merchants need. But, you know, it's, it's always good to have a friend in the ecosystem to get stuff done when you need it. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I've been doing partnerships now for over, you know, three and a half years. And I think um, that is a catalyst within the other side of the wall gardens of the internet, like the Amazons, the Facebooks, the Googles. Um, they're unavoidable, but I think the partnerships is what keeps that Elmer's glue together on our side of the stack. So I'm happy to be able to contribute that and, you know, offer a good solution to our merchants. Cool. Well, you know, you've been very generous with your time today. Um, James, any uh, parting thoughts, anything else to add before we wrap up? You know, I, first, I just want to say thank you. You know, it's been great to contribute. Um, I, I definitely am excited to, you know, see how this, um, you know, impacts other merchants and um, improving, you know, those, those post-purchase experiences um, on my new venture here. So you'll be seeing me in the future. Um, I'd love to be, uh, you know, uh, continue these conversations and um, see where else we may be able to add value to, you know, our subscriber base. Awesome. Well, I'll be looking forward to it. I'm sure that our listeners will be too. Uh, to those of you out there that, that have uh, tuned in uh, for this episode, either for on video or audio, um, thank you as always. Uh, we appreciate you and uh, we look forward to bringing you some more content like this shortly. Subscribe wherever you're, uh, you're listening to us now and uh, uh, happy selling.